I wasn't much curious about teaching and education when I was studying at my university. I remember that I was required to do all the modules, I was required to do an internship at the high school in order to get my qualification. Um, and I discovered my passion towards teaching and education later on when I started to work as a lecturer at my own faculty. So, um, uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, uh, I discovered the passion towards education and later on while I was working on my PhD thesis, uh, I got a chance to join one of the best international colleges in this region. And I started to teach their science and also a course which is about knowledge, which is about how we know the things, how do we actually learn the things around us. And I want to tell you a story about uh, uh, one of my classes that I had a couple years ago. So I was helping students to make their own research, to write a research paper, and I was teaching them how to use different resources for citations. And on that lesson, I remember I was bombarded with all sorts of arguments why Wikipedia cannot be considered as a relevant source. They were like, yeah, yeah, it's a good source. Let's, let's cite it. It's easy. You Google it and it pops up. It's the best one to use. So I decided to not confront the students because teenagers don't love it, trust me. No teenagers love confrontation. And I decided to do a small exercise with them. Uh, an exercise was about uh, this thing. So uh, I asked them to open an article about the topic that they were researching on and uh, or edit this article on Wikipedia. I asked them to add some false information there on the articles in order to uh, make them a little bit curious about why, what I'm doing. So it, because it was a, in, an interesting exercise, I decided to be a part of that exercise. So I just thought about on spot, I just thought that I'll add my brother's name to list of Ukrainian oligarchs. Don't ask me why, I just thought about it on spot. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, my brother had no relations to Ukrainian oligarchs, and I want to believe that still he has no relation to that uh, list of people. So uh, we agreed with my students that we'll open these articles after a month, and we will see what amendments were done to these articles, where they're actually corrected. So what happened is after a month, we opened the articles, and I had 16 students in my class. 12 of the articles about these very specific and narrow topics were not corrected. So the false information that we used there was still present there. So it was a very wonderful experience, not only for them, and, but also for me. I started to think about learning and actually uh, understanding how do we percept the information. And um, I, I discovered, I mean, this is probably a very well-known fact, but uh, we get more than 80% of information through our eyes. And yet, our brain, when it works together with our eyes, is not actually processing that information. It is just catching the information. It tries to save all this information. It's not sorting them. It's not actually processing them. So here is the point when I discovered another word, which was very interesting for me. Knowledge. What is actually knowledge? From which point we can actually say that information was converted into a knowledge? That was a very interesting question for me and also for my students, but I was starting to work on that uh, independently, just didn't want to overwhelm them. So, uh, so I discovered that every day we are bombarded with lots of lots of information. But the thing is that this pressure of information is not allowing us to save this information in form of knowledge. So according to Plato, the knowledge is justified through belief. If you like philosophy, this is probably the most common and fundamental and accurately described uh, definition of what is knowledge. But I, I started to think about knowledge in a little bit different way, using my own words. And I, I felt that knowledge is actually like a map. It helps us to understand the world around us. It helps us to understand 
the mental world, the spiritual world, the emotional world, the microscopic world that we can see. So knowledge is something very crucial. It can be produced by one or many human beings and it is being preserved over the generation. So, um, and then I decided to think about how do we actually learn the things. And we are all registered on different social networks and we all the time collect this information from all around the place. We start to watch videos, simulations, animations, which is really good. And the, the whole task of our brain is actually to use this converter to convert information, just a bunch of numbers and data into any knowledge. So even right now, if you open your social network page and you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a bunch of information. You can see how we can modify the genes in order to get a biological creature which will have the specific characteristics, specific traits that we want it to have. And uh, we can see how we can slow down the climate change. There is a lot of smart stuff there on the web. But how we actually deal with this stuff? We can see many, many videos. Uh, this is just something that I recorded from my phone. You can see all sorts of things. And I, I, I believe that you all are seeing this every day when you open the, uh, your social networks. So uh, what, what happens with that, this bunch of information? Google CEO announced that every two days we create as much information as human civilization created, produced since the beginning up to 2003. Just think about this number. Every two days we produce as much of information as uh, we generated from the beginning of human civilization. Let me bring this into the number so you can imagine it better. If we try to convert this information into megabytes, which is the unit for information, we get more than 5.49 trillion megabytes of information produced every two days. Every two days. This is about 5 million photos by smartphones. And if we try to put it this in the perspective of a year, and we multiply this by the number of days, we get more than one quadrillion megabytes. Can we actually imagine this number? This is the amount of information to which we are being exposed to. I mean, this is what we produce every day. If we look even into deeper here, it's, it shouldn't be surprising us that much. We never talked about this much of information, but right now, every single one of you, you have 100 times of more information in megabytes in your DNA molecules, in your life molecules. And this information size actually shouldn't impress us to that extent, but it is expressing, and it's, this is a huge flood of information from our brain. So what we actually do this with this information, when we are exposed to same amount of information every day as 14th century individual would encounter in their entire life, every day, every 24 hours, we interact with information which is equivalent to 174 newspaper worth data. Just think about this number. So I, I started to think about uh, how, what we do in terms of educators, how the system is ready to compete with this kind of information. And if we look into the classroom designs, uh, nothing has changed much. Nothing has changed much. Still, the structure is the same. We have one person who delivers some knowledge, some information, and many learners. Yes, we, we have one teacher, one professor standing here and delivering some information. So in terms of structure, nothing has changed much. But in terms of technologies, we developed quite fast. We have projectors, we have electronic whiteboards, we have all kinds of online facilities, registers, tools, calculators, everything. But the recent study shows that even though the technologies developed that fast, and when the teachers are actually implementing these technologies into their, in their classroom practice, the results are not very different. The results are not very different, and I'm not talking about uh, the exam results, because considering the change or the improvement of educational system by looking into the exam results is wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. We can't actually say that that's true. What we can use actually as an indicator is the curiosity level, the interest of students. How many of students 
decided to go further into their learning. How many students are actually uh, learning more from different fields? So psychologists like to categorize people of 21st uh, century in a group of people which are called visual learners. We became a society of visual learners. You like learning from visual ads? I don't know, you like to use simulations for learning? You are most probably a visual learner. This is how psychologists would like to put you into, into a bigger context. But let's try to understand why actually it happens. Why do we like that a one minute long Facebook videos about something or you go to YouTube, there is a very nice video which explains briefly everything. Why we like this? We like this because we like when someone is doing the thinking part instead of us. We like, yeah, that's a very convenient thing to do. Just think about it. Thinking so about something and trying to accumulate that information in form of knowledge and making connections between that information is pretty stressful thing to do. If you try to actually connect the knowledge to each other, it can be something very unpleasant uh, thing to do. I, just a couple minutes ago, I showed you some big, big numbers. I didn't tell you how to use them. What's the point of that uh, demonstration? How useful was my visual demonstration for you for learning? I don't think that it was very useful. I mean, if you remember the cool photo of DNA, that's, that's fine. I love DNA. DNA is a nice molecule. But, uh, but it's not about uh, liking or disliking something. It's, it's more about learning. It is more about converting that information into a knowledge. So my point here is not actually to boycott or fight against the videos. I just want you to think about it. I just want you to question the efficiency of these videos in terms of forming deep understanding on a particular topic. How useful are they? And uh, I, I honestly would like to disagree with this uh, categorizing of people into this or to that tribe or society. We are not visual learners, no. Technologies develop quite fast. The human brain needs much more time to develop. It was like this all the time. Nature requires time, evolution requires time, so our brain requires time to adapt to these technologies. But uh, the technologies are going to develop uh, uh, without actually asking us any questions or, I don't know, uh, sorting some issues with us. So the, the real problem is that our brain is not actually uh, doing this conversion of information to knowledge. So what we get, we get just a glance, just a, a brief understanding on a topic that we can barely explain in our own words and we get something which I would like to call illusion of knowing. This is what we feel when we are done with watching videos. We got an illusion of understanding and this is something very dangerous uh, that I believe can strike the modern educational system. It's part of human nature to overvalue the things that we can measure and undervalue the things that we can't measure. It's a part of human nature. So my point is, is how we can make this work. I mean, this is what we have in reality. This conversion is not happening with us. We are all in the same situation. We, we deal with these big clusters of information which are not connected to each other. So I still believe in the culture of formal education. I really think that it can work, but it's more about the priorities of the lecturer or a professor or an educator. Call it in, in the way that you would like to. So the priority must not be given to just shooting a bunch of facts or expecting students to remember this, uh, these facts, but the priority of a teacher must be to take from hand of a student and guide them through the social process of learning. This is social process. Learning is social process. We, we live all together. The classroom is an environment. Uh, this kind of auditorium is an environment. There is social interactions. And the role of teacher must be to make students curious about s subjects, to make students ask questions like, how do we know what we know? How this can be related to that one? These are, these are the kind of questions that I think that people from 21st century must ask. So the, we shouldn't c categorize people. So I would like to connect this specifically 
to the age group of 15 to 18 years old young people, teenagers. They are crazy. They, most of the time they have no idea what they are doing, but, but I really love them. They breathe this raw, uh, unbridled passion to make change around them. They want to change. They want to change themselves. They want to change the surrounding. They want to be a part of change. And this is what, what actually was driving the human civilization. A process which is occurring naturally changes evolution. Also occurs in a society. So education must actually shape the mindset of these people by not shaping it in a particular way. I don't know whether I can break it down into a simpler idea, but it must, the, the education must take them away from this illusion of knowing and equip them with the skills of asking proper questions. This is what we actually lack nowadays. So what I suggest, what is the takeaway message here? Information flood is real, it happens, and it's a part of the times that we are living. We shouldn't fight against it. But I really want you to suggest, I, I mean, I want to suggest you something that I try to practice once in a week. I would like to call it information diet. Once in a week, no internet, no Facebook, no YouTube, nothing. Don't do it. Socialize. Whatever you want. Sleep. Doesn't matter. Allow your brain to segment the information. Allow it to put it into different places. Allow it to make connections. In other words, allow it to process the information that you got throughout the week. So, uh, what I would like to say is that when we become adults and we start doing the, the things that all adult, adults do, like working, paying taxes, paying bills, we also stop to question the world around us. So, we don't question anything. This happens like this, yeah, that's, that's fine, this is how it should work. So, what happens is actually we try, we start to reinforce the, the we look for evidence to reinforce our models of truth. We try to reinforce the knowledge that we have by looking for an evidence. So we don't question uh, the, the world around us. And um, what happens is that we start to avoid using I and amateur in one sentence. We are adults, we know how to do the things. I got a degree, I know how to do the things. Or I have this much of experience. We start doubting. But if we look into the word, into the roots of the word amateur, which comes from the Greek word amare, to love, we can feel the passion, we can feel the curiosity, we can feel the interest. But if we compare it to a word user, you don't feel any emotions, you don't feel any passions if you just say the word user. And we became users. So what I would like to suggest you is, t is make a reasonable deal with time. Make a reasonable time and question the world around you. Thank you.